We're actually going to take a look at Matthew 17 and begin there this morning. So if you will, turn to Matthew 17. And we'll begin reading in just a moment from verse 24. Matthew 17, 24. It was a big church, and the elementary children had just returned to their departments after the joint worship service. The Minister of Education was walking to the front of the empty auditorium to collect the offering, but he was unaware there was a preschool group that was sitting there. They had slipped in a couple of pews to be in the big church. As he was walking, the teacher asked children, do you know who this is? And one of the children said, it's God and his money. <laughs> you know, children often will say the first thing that comes to her, their minds. Uh, they can be frank and honest about things, and, and, uh, and I'm glad for that most of the time. <clears throat> so <laughs> uh, adults are sometimes frank and honest. Sometimes they're not. But sometimes when adults are frank, they may say things and they don't care how other people feel about what they're saying. They don't care if they hurt someone else's feelings. Uh, any of us can be like that at times, including me. We've got to be cautious about that, I believe. It's not a great virtue to say just whatever comes into your head. <laughs> it's good to think about something first before you say it. Uh, maybe if you're in the relationship with the Lord that you should be in, and, and you're seeking to please him, you'll be sure that what you're about to say is going to please him. Uh, if you've done things wrong in your past, and I think probably all of us have, would you want to tell us about all the minute details of things you've done wrong? I don't think so. But sometimes as Christians, we can be tempted to tell other people about details of someone else who've made mistakes and sins and, and done things wrong. And, and that's called gossip. And we're going to look at uh, Jesus, what, uh, what he says in this passage this morning. <clears throat> He's going to be talking about seeking those who have strayed away. It can be believers. It can be unbelievers. Seeking those who have strayed away. But before we do that, uh, again, I'm approaching the life of Jesus chronologically. There's something that happens uh, that is chronological here. And if you're a fisherman, you might like this story. So uh, this is only found, the passage I'm going to read here in Matthew 17 is only found in the Gospel of Matthew. And you might recall that Matthew was the tax collector. He also had the name of Levi. Now the Jews were trying, the Jewish leaders were trying to find something wrong with Jesus so they could prosecute him. So there's a couple of, that's kind of preparing you for what we're going to read here. Matthew 17, 24, uh, there's an emphasis on submitting to governing authorities. Matthew 17, 24, when they came to Capernaum, those who collected the two drachma tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the two drachma tax? And he said, he said, yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax from their sons or from strangers? When Peter said from strangers, Jesus said to him, then the sons are exempt. However, so that we do not offend them, go to the sea and throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me. So note that Jesus knew that Peter had been questioned and addressed the question before Peter even raised this issue. How could Jesus know this unless he was God. And he could not have known it unless he was God. This is indication of his divinity. So we see when the Jesus and his disciples arrived back in Capernaum, the tax collectors were wait, waiting for him. They were, 
uh, this uh, two drachma tax was a tax to pay to help support the temple and I don't believe it's mentioned um, in the Old Testament perhaps it is but Peter and Jesus had apparently not paid this tax and their question about the Lord not paying his tax implied he's not keeping the law so Peter responded that the Lord would pay the tax in compliance with the law. And then before Peter even spoke to Jesus about this, uh, Jesus asked him if kings collect duty and taxes from their own sons. And the answer would have been no. If you're the king of the land, you're not gonna tax your own sons. You're gonna tax everyone else and the tax money comes to you. So that's what Jesus is saying here. Now they, the sons had a privileged position and in our society, political leaders do pay taxes. Somehow they seem to end up pretty rich, but I'll not get into politics this morning. But they, uh, that wasn't the case back then. Now the Lord did submit to governing authorities. He did not want to offend even though he was divine, he did not need to pay this tax, nor did Peter need to pay this tax. But he did not want to offend these religious rulers, so he was going to pay the tax. This is very important, I think, as we look at the next few verses. Jesus is not seeking to offend people. <laughs> and we should not be seeking to offend people. We should be seeking to help people come to know the Lord Jesus. Okay, so next we're going to pick up at 18 verse 10, Matthew 18 verse 10. And we're going to see Jesus calls us to seek the lost sinner. It says in verse 10, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think if any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. Now to get a better understanding of what these verses, what Jesus is speaking about, I want to go back and look at Matthew 18, verses 3 through 9. And we spoke about this last week, so I'm not spending a lot of time with it. But in verse 3, he says, Matthew 18, 3, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't matter what church you're part of. You need to become converted to the Christian church. Faith. You need to put your faith in Jesus and repent of sin. That's what it's all about, regardless of which, which church you're part of. Verse 4, whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two feet or two, two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. So someone might boldly say, I don't care if someone's offended by what I say. But Christ is concerned. He wants us to be concerned that we not offend others needlessly. And our Lord desires all to be saved all to come into a relationship with Jesus. Now the word of God, oh by the way, Matthew 18, 14. 
says, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. God desires all to be saved. And I could share other verses with you that indicate that. Now, the word of God will offend people. No one likes to be called a sinner that I'm aware of. But I don't want to needlessly condemn people. We looked in the uh, Sunday school time about Jesus approaching this woman who had been married multiple times. And he did not condemn her. He offered her living water. God wants us to have a desire to help people come to know him. God wants all people to be saved, and we should as well. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, and we <coughs> should seek to bring others to faith in Christ. So it's in the context of love and forgiveness, we find Jesus talking about the restoration of the fallen brother or sister. Okay, now this is where we're going to pick up at Matthew 18, verse 15. Seek the saved sinner. You could refer to this section. Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how, how shall my brother... Uh, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 77 times, or pardon me, 70 times seven. So the focus of the rest of the message will be on first the purpose of forgiveness, God's plan for forgiveness, and a parable of forgiveness. Forgiveness. When Christians have differences within a church, and by the way, I'm not preaching this because of, you know, we've got a lot of differences among us. <laughs> That's not the reason. The reason is because this is the next passage in the chronological study of Christ. But oftentimes, Christians do have differences with one another. And it can lead to bitterness and animosity. And I don't like to see that in a church. I trust you don't need either. And if, if there's uh, disputes within a church, a local church, one should not go outside the church to seek to settle the dispute. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 6, does any of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? And he's talking about a neighbor within the church. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? I'm still learning about that. How much more matters of this life? So when we have differences within a church, we ought to come together as a church and seek to resolve the differences, not go outside of the church. Now here's the purpose of forgiveness, verse 15 that we might gain our brother, win over our brother. When a Christian is caught in some sin, some grievous sin, the purpose is to go not to condemn them, but to restore them to the fellowship, to win them. When, when, Jesus, when our, our Lord speaks here of winning someone, gaining someone, it's an under indication every person is a treasure to the Lord. And every person should be a treasure to us. Listen to Proverbs 31, pardon me, chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. 
My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. I can tell you from plenty of my own experience, when I have fallen into sin, the Lord has reproved me. It's not always an enjoyable process. There are times when you and I as believers need to talk with other members of the church if we see that they're in some sin. No, oh, preacher, I, that, that, I don't want to do that. I understand. I don't like to confront people with their sin. That's not something I want to do. In fact, if you want to do this, you probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, no, but it's uh, if if the Lord loves us, he will reprove us. If we love one another, there are times we need to reprove one another. And God can lead us and guide us in that process. In fact, it's essential that he leads and guide us. I don't want to be reproving people unless God leads me to do that. Listen to the encouragement in James 5, 19 and 20. James says, my brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So we can spend more time on that passage, but the emphasis is if you see a brother or sister in Christ straying away from the Lord, we are to do what we can to try to bring them back. Proverbs 11:30 says, and he who is wise wins soul. Now I want to give you some objections that Christians have to correcting other Christians. Here's the first one, the argument of privacy. Some would say, well, you know, each person can do whatever they want. It's up to them. It's between them and the Lord. People certainly have a right to privacy. But if you become a member of an organization like a church, there are certain understandings that you should have about being part of that group. And yes, you can do what you want. I mean, you have that freedom. But a church also has the freedom to uh, disfellowship with someone if need be. And again, the purpose is not to disfellowship with anyone. It's to help someone. It's to regain someone. That's the purpose of forgiveness. So, uh, by the way, we sometimes have uh, people who just visit our church. Now, please hear me. If that's what God leads you to do, do that. I'm delighted. I'm thankful for his visitors. If God leaded you to join, I'd be delighted. I want you to do what the Lord wants. And so uh, if someone just visits, that's fine. They're a visitor. So people have a right to privacy, but also God wants us to seek to restore those who are in sin. Here's another argument against correcting others. The argument for permissiveness. Who are we to tell others what they're doing wrong? Who are we to say it? God causes, you know, calls us to be careful about being judgmental. But there are times we need to exercise judgment as believers. I trust when you call someone as pastor that you do some research on the person and you seek to do some, uh, you know, find out a little more about that person and make some judgment. If someone is going to become a deacon, or teach a class, I would expect someone to do some research on the person and seek to find out, is this person qualified? So there are times we need to, we, uh, we need to uh, show some judgment. And so um, here's another argument against correcting other argument, uh, pardon me, against correcting others. The argument of pride. Now, really, this isn't an argument. It's just an attitude that a person can have. It's like, uh, I really don't want so-and-so corrected because I am superior to them. I'm holier than they are. So, in other words, we can have the wrong attitude in our life, and that's the wrong reason we're not willing to correct others. 
Here's another reason uh, against correcting others, the argument of persecution. Some would say, well, God has not called us to persecute others, but to encourage them. I agree. Let's encourage others. That's what we ought to be focused on, encouraging others. Seeking to help others follow the Lord. But if a Christian is caught in some grievous sin, we need to encourage them to get out of that sin, that sinful lifestyle. We need to seek to help them. Here's another argument against uh, correcting others, the argument for peacefulness. We need to have peace. We need to have peace. Well, I agree, peace is great. It's wonderful to have peace within a church, but not peace at the compromise of truth. All right, now notice the plan for forgiveness. Here's what the Lord says we're, we're to do. And by the way, uh, Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, um, Paul is helpful in this. He says, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby, thereby fulfill the law of Christ. So the word for restore means to repair something to its original condition. So if you... Uh, fractured your bone, the doctor may, you know, move it around a little bit, try to get it back to its original position. And if your fishing net gets torn, someone might begin to work on it to get it back to its original uh, condition. So with love and humility, when, when a fellow believer falls into sin, we're to seek to restore them to that condition that we had before they fell into sin. And of course, we've got to be cautious about this. Uh, we want to have our heart right before we seek to get someone else's heart right. You might recall Jesus says in Matthew 7, uh, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So here's the plan of Jesus from these verses, Matthew 8, 15. Go and show him his fault in private. In other words, if someone is caught in sin, and I know about it, I need to talk to them privately. I need to go to them in private. <coughs> That's what you need to do as well. Go to him in private. Now, if you go to someone else, you got to be cautious about this because you could begin gossip talking about someone's failure with others, uh, and that can hurt those people. And our desire is not to hurt people, it's to help them. Now, going to someone, you may say, well, go to someone in private and talk to them about their fault. Yeah, if I love someone, that's what I need to do. Now, I realize they may not respond very positively. Sometimes people do respond positively. They appreciate what you're trying to do. Maybe they're not right. They're, they're not at the time in their life where they need to get the, you know. Uh, and let me put it this way. There may be times when you go to someone and you seek to correct them in love and humility. And they will appreciate what you're doing. But they're not ready to give up their sin yet. That's sad when it happens. But that can't happen. And of course, sometimes if you go to someone privately and gently and with love and compassion and you seek to correct them, they may seek to correct you <laughs> in, in something that you're doing that they think is wrong. And that's, that's a risk you take, you know. And, and when people have said something like that to me, I'll say, well, I'll pray about that. I want to do what God wants, uh, you know, if, if you... If you think that's a fault in my life, I want to be sure it's not. I, I, I'll go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to show me if it is. But uh, we're to go to that person privately. Second, Jesus says, if he will not hear you, take a witness or two with you so that every word may be established. And here's the third step. Oh, by the way, it's important if 
if an elder is being, a pastor is being, the word elder and pastor are two words that refer to the same office. If a pastor or elder is being uh, uh, accused of something, there ought to be more than one witness. Here's the third step. If one neglects to hear them, then tell it to the church and let the church disfellowship from them. Now, if we had time, if this was a class, I would ask you, have you seen this happen in churches before? I'd be interested to see what you'd say. Uh, it doesn't bring joy, joy to my heart to disfellowship with someone. The whole purpose of reaching out to someone in sin is to bring them back. But this is part of the process. If they will, if they decide they're going to continue in some grievous sin against the Lord, then the church has to take a stand. In fact, the scripture says open rebuke is better than hidden love. So if we say, oh, I love everybody, I'm not going to confront anybody with their sin, we're not really loving people. Open rebuke is better than hidden love, the scripture says. Now again, it's not because I've got someone I've got to address in this church, and that's why I'm preaching this message. That's not it. <laughs> I'm preaching this message because this is what Jesus says in these verses. He is looking at the cross. He's about to die for our sins. For a world he loves more than we know more than we realize. And he wants us to love one another and be willing to correct one another. Well, let's move on to the parable of forgiveness. The parable of forgiveness. This is in verse 23. This will be short. No, don't worry. I'll read it, but uh, it's a long passage, but I'm not going to say a lot about it. I think it speaks for itself. For this reason, Matthew 18, 23, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, which would have been much less. And he seized him and began to choke him saying, pay back what you owe. So to his fellow slave, his, pardon me, so his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. One of the true marks that someone has become a believer in Christ is their willingness to forgive others who have hurt them. And hanging on to bitterness in our lives does us no good. You may say, well, someone still owes me a debt. I'd urge you, let the Lord be the debt collector. You're his child. If you're a child of God, if you put your faith in Christ, you're a child of God, let the Lord be the debt collector. But it's not going to help you to hold a grudge against some, someone, to be bitter against someone. Would you bow with me in prayer? 
Lord, I'm so thankful for your willingness to forgive us. We have so many sins that we have needed forgiveness of, and you've provided forgiveness. And so help us not to be like this man in this parable who's unwilling to forgive others. We're not to have bitterness in our hearts. We're not to have a grudge against someone. You don't call us to do that. But also, your forgiveness is based on repentance. So if someone does not repent, turn away from sin, they may have to be disfellowshipped from a church. If someone will not turn away from their sin, they will not enter into the kingdom of heaven until they turn from their sin and put their faith in Christ. But you don't hate those who turn away from you. You love them and you seek to restore them. And I pray, Lord, that you will speak to our hearts this morning, whatever you want us to do with this message. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you would help us as we walk with you every day to determine how we can use this message in our life. Help us know that you love every person around us, even the ones who hurt us. And help us not to hate them as a result of that. And then, Lord, if there's uh, some decision that needs to be made this morning to join the fellowship of our church, to come forward for baptism, if someone's trusted Christ and never been baptized, or to receive Christ as Savior, Lord, I would rejoice if someone would come this morning. And and, uh, or maybe just for prayer, and I would be glad to pray with anyone who came. Lord, I pray for your will to be done in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me?